Hello and welcome to The Daily Climate Show. Coming up today, an international team of scientists concludes the current drought in the Horn of Africa wouldn't have happened without climate change. Millions are threatened by floods in the US as exceptional snow melt swells the Mississippi River. And BP shareholders vote against the re-election of its chairman in a revolt against the scaling back of its climate change targets. And welcome to The Daily Climate Show, where we track the changes to our world and investigate some of the potential solutions to the climate crisis. Millions of people in the Horn of Africa are facing famine as they enter their fourth year of drought. In Somalia alone, it's believed to have caused the deaths of as many as 43,000 people last year. Well, now experts have concluded that the drought wouldn't have happened without climate change. Scientists from the World Weather Attribution Group say that as a result of human-induced climate change, the combination of low rainfall and high evapotranspiration, which is how much water evaporates from soil and plants because of higher temperatures, well, that would not have led to drought at all in a 1.2 degree cooler world. It goes on. Climate change has made events like the current drought much stronger and more likely. A conservative estimate is that such droughts have become about a hundred times more likely. Let's talk to one of the report's authors, Dr. Mariam Zakaria. She's from the Grantham Institute for Climate Change at Imperial College London. Um, thank you so much for talking to us. Just how much of an effect has human-caused climate change had on this particular drought? To understand the signal of climate change, we looked at three possible definitions. So in two of these cases, we looked only at uh, the rainfall that uh, the, the rainfall event itself. And then in a third case, we also looked at both rainfall and the effect of temperature. Now, when we looked at rainfall, uh, we could see that the region in the region that we considered, there are two distinct rainfall seasons. So in the long rain season or the March, April, May rain season, that is a drying trend. Whereas for the October, November, December or the short rain season, that the there is there is no climate evident climate change signal, or rather there is a wetting trend in, in that. And then we also looked at because given that the drought has been ongoing for uh five continuous seasons. We also looked at uh, the uh, rainfall over two years together. And in this case, we saw that uh, there is no uh, signal. But then, uh, you know, uh, as 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 with as 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 it is with climate change, that we also should consider the effect of the regional warming and uh, the impact of regional warming on um, rainfall rainfall deficits, and which is why we look, we considered the combination of precipitation and uh, the potential evapotranspiration, which is imp which determines the amount of water that evaporates from the soil through uh, evapotranspiration. Now, looking at this, we could see that uh, the this combination of precipitation and evapotranspiration would have been uh, has been made a uh, hundred times more likely in the current world as compared to a world without climate change. Hmm. Okay, so isn't the rainfall, isn't the area experiencing a lot of rainfall at the moment? Will that help with what's going on? Um, the, so during the season, uh, yes. So uh, the on uh, in, uh, now that in May uh, there's a there's a, a El Nino forecasted, and that is supposed to uh, bring so this season. Uh, it's supposed to rain a little more, but then uh, you know studies show that uh, because of the uh, effects of this continuous rainfall uh, seasons failing over the last five seasons, it will take time to uh, to overcome the uh, or. To, to sort of to um, to um, to reduce the the threats that is uh, currently uh, the, the threats that the region is currently faced with at the moment. Okay, Dr. Mariam, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Oh, well, some of today's other stories now, and a global team of scientists have set themselves the goal of discovering 100,000 new species in a decade before they say overfishing and global warming drive entire populations to extinction. Ocean Census has been funded by Japan's Nippon Foundation and the UK-based Marine Research Institute, Necton. 
They plan to use evolutions in DNA extraction, gene sequencing, machine learning and artificial intelligence to describe species at speed and scale. The ocean holds four billion years of our evolutionary heritage. And this priceless asset is now, as we all know, at grave risk. It is a significant failure in our generation's stewardship of the planet to know so little about so much. Ocean Census' objective is to redeem that failure. If, between us all, we fail in the task, humans will die. And the ocean, of course, will survive. In the US, rising waters on the Mississippi River are engulfing entire neighborhoods and reaching what experts call a major flood stage. That's in Iowa, Minnesota and Wisconsin. Most of California's Yosemite Valley will be closed to visitors from this weekend, and Iowa's third largest city is braced for major flooding. More potentially damaging flooding is expected in the coming weeks as the snow from this year's bumper season continues to melt. And the king has approved the first royal gold medal for architecture of his reign. The winner is a champion of zero-carbon self-build houses for displaced people. Professor Yasmin Lari is Pakistan's first female architect, and her work has seen the creation of 50,000 sustainable shelters. The medal she's won is awarded to those who've had a significant influence on the advancement of architecture. BP's annual general meeting has been interrupted by multiple protesters, some of whom have been carried out of the venue by security. Now, the oil giant is facing a revolt by shareholders who are voting against the re-election of its chairman after its climate change targets were cut. Five UK pension funds are involved in the revolt, including Nest, the government's workplace pension scheme. Now, Katarina Linmeyer is the Senior Responsible Investment Manager at Nest. She joins us now. Katarina, thank you so much for talking to us. So what are you hoping to achieve by this vote? Because it hasn't changed their emissions targets, has it? Ultimately, this is a vote to register our concern with the direction of travel. This is really an unprecedented situation. We've not yet seen a company set fairly ambitious climate targets and then only nine months later row back on them. And what's been even more disappointing to us is that while BP consulted on its initial short to medium term oil and gas production targets at the last AGM, when they made the decision to change the targets in February this year, they did not commit to bring them back to an investor vote. We have engaged with BP privately on this and asked the company to offer shareholders another vote, and they refused to give us that opportunity. We've therefore escalated our engagement to vote against the chair to register our concern with the process and the governance around this decision. So there are five big pension funds voting against him, including yours, but you represent less than 1% of the company's shares. Do you really think you're going to make a difference with this vote? We actually represent over a third of the UK workforce, so we do have a large share of members behind this decision. The main aim of this is to register that concern and to get BP to speak to us about the decision and bring this back to a shareholder vote. Why don't you just invest elsewhere? If you're trying to make a statement, why don't you just pull your funds and invest elsewhere? We invest in a broad range of companies, but we really think that BP needs to be part of the transition. And we want BP to be a long-term sustainable holding for our members. We therefore think it's really important that we use the opportunity that we have as a shareholder to engage with the company and to use the voting rights that we get at the annual general meeting to challenge the board and hold them to account on their commitment to net zero. Well, BP have said that it values constructive challenge and engagement. Have they engaged with you on this at all? We have had engagement with BP on this issue and we continue to speak to the company about it. But crucially, while BP has previously submitted targets to a shareholder vote, they have not done so with this particular decision. And we believe it's heading in the wrong direction for the company and not taking into account the long-term financial risks that climate change poses and the need to transition within this decade. And this is why we've taken the decision to escalate our engagement by voting against the re-election of the chair. 
And what happens if nothing happens and they stick to their new targets? What will you do then? There are other opportunities for investors to escalate engagement. Of course, we hope to continue the dialogue with BP and we hope to see them set more ambitious climate targets in future. But we have previously divested from companies where we haven't seen the progress that we would have liked from engagement. For example, about a year and a half ago, we divested from the US energy company ExxonMobil after a three-year engagement process did not bring sufficient progress in their approach to managing climate change risk. Okay, Katarina, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Uh, and just to say, we did approach BP for a comment, but received no response to the pension fund's criticisms. Now, before we go, a reminder that you can watch The Climate Show with Tom Heap this weekend. That's on Saturday and Sunday at 3pm and then again at 7.30pm. Thank you so much for watching. That's all from us today. Goodbye. <laughs>